my group works on inorganic materials. We interested in magnetic materials uh, in particular, and we essentially are uh, performing the synthesis of materials, their characterization, advanced characterization, working together with the National Lab. So that's uh, the main area of my research. Uh, so usually I start with looking at the solicitation very carefully and that's the first thing I do. I read through the entire solicitation usually, uh, trying to understand what is required and what is the grant for, uh, after which I, can, I start thinking how my research can fit into the solicitation aspects and uh, how I can tailor my particular research interests with that grant solicitation request. Then after that, uh, I essentially start breaking down, outlining the proposal, right? thinking about the motivation, the background, significance uh, of my research in the light of that specific proposal request. And then um, I, after I have the outline, I sit down and start writing. That's essentially how I approach it. So usually I would start uh, about two months ahead of time. Uh, I actually start thinking about proposal earlier than that, but my specific planning starts about uh, two months before the proposal deadline. And the first month is spent uh, almost completely on uh, coming up with ideas, researching literature as re relevant to those ideas, um, trying to find things that might be interesting and uh, some of them don't work out after you do the literature search. Um, some of them appear to be interesting and innovative. And after I refine my ideas by looking at the previous work, you know, by talking to my students, um, thinking about them more, then the second month, you know, the month before the proposal deadline is dedicated to writing the proposal. So the career award, uh, the way I approached that award was a little bit different from the regular award. Uh, the career cycle, you can uh, submit the grant in summer, right? So I actually wrote a regular and a SAF grant ahead of time, which was due in October or September. I don't remember exactly right now. Uh, but that grant was the regular one for which I got the reviews back in April. And that was extremely helpful because I could see what was not done very well in that proposal. And so essentially I already had that proposal written, I had to revise it. So I spent a lot of time working on different uh, science related questions and investigating, you know, researching um, some of those issues that uh, reviewers saw. And then essentially I rewrote the entire proposal within two weeks before the deadline. Um, I could probably rewrite it earlier, but it was already written quite well for the beginning. But for those faculty who start from scratch, I would suggest starting you know, three, two months in advance and spending maybe at least a month, planning at least a month for the writing process. I also would recommend finishing earlier, you know, like two weeks before the deadline to be able to get some feedback from colleagues, from senior colleagues or people who got career awards before and try to get some feedback from them to revise the proposal. Well, uh, to be honest with you, many people would not respond to your request for feedback. So you really need to find somebody who will do due diligence and look at your proposal. Usually a week is sufficient time because if people are going to look at your proposal, they will. And it's better to ask when will you be willing to look at the proposal and then bring the proposal to those who will look at it and give them about a week. Because usually from my experience, the proposal lays around 
in my hand for too long and I don't get to it, right? That's not really helpful. So you have to find somebody who will be really helpful and uh, really play active mentorship role. And that's more important, you know, finding that person than to think about how much time I'm to give, to give them. Uh, so I had um, three parts. Uh, my first part was uh, maybe two, three pages. Uh, I think it was de dedicated mainly to outlining the general um, goals of my career proposal, both research and educational, and how they come together. Uh, it was about two pages in length. And then I had uh, about nine, ten pages of research part. And about three pages of the educational part um, and of course uh, you have some remainder dedicated to broader impact uh, that's about half a page to one page uh, that's actually a challenging part and so you have to uh, really try to think about the integration because that actually is important uh, when your proposal is reviewed. Uh, you just need to think about uh, why you are here in an educational institution and think how your research interests help your teaching and how you can tailor your teaching to be relevant to what your research is about. Uh, one thing that I was doing very actively, I was uh, explaining in the research part how we'll engage, for example, undergraduate students in research in the lab and how we will transfer some of the findings we get from our research into courses that we will develop. So I think this is really important and uh, if you carefully plan all you know, this interaction between the two parts of the proposal, this will be helpful, but the most important is to point this out in the proposal. So in the proposal you have to explicitly state, in the research part you have to throw in a few educational statements uh, and then in the educational part, you can also mention you know, how the, this, some of these uh, educational activities was, will be tied into your research goals or your research results. Uh, and uh, I even used uh, such, uh, you know, such techniques as bolding in those statements or underlining them so the reviewers would pay attention to them. Uh, so I had two activities. Uh, one of them was uh, developing curriculum in materials chemistry. And uh, a positive thing about that and a kind of strong uh, side of this proposal was that I already started doing those activities in our department. So when I applied for my career grant, I already had a framework uh, for setting up that education activity. Um, so it's not something that I had to create from zero. I already started doing that. And I would recommend that you know, the uh, junior faculty start working on their educational ideas right away, very early on. Um, and uh, the second part was uh, creating manuals for uh, different kind of instrumentations in our material, materials characterization lab. Uh, so that also is useful for you know, educating graduate students. So my educational activities were mainly focused on graduate students and educational graduate students in material science and closer to the end of my proposal, I was suggesting to connect those educational activities into undergraduate students in the senior, senior and junior undergraduate students, and eventually we did that you know, in the end of my proposals. So we started uh, offering uh, an undergraduate course in materials chemistry and engaging undergraduates more into the um, characterization methods that we have in our department. In a way, engaging undergraduate students in research is a broader impact. Uh, just teaching an undergraduate course is not a broader impact, it's part of our job. Uh, so I think uh, broader impacts should be defined as something that goes just beyond your regular job description or expectations. Right? If you engage uh, underrepresented groups in research, if you 
engage more undergraduate students in research that broader impact. If you <coughs> uh, create, for example, materials, you know, uh, training materials we were creating would be available to anybody outside of FSU as well. And that's broader impact because you step outside of the institutional boundaries. Um, so those kind of things could be considered broader impact. And my broader impacts were essentially more active engagement of undergraduates in research and um, spreading out our uh, methods and findings outside the FSU. Uh, all my research is really interdisciplinary, so overall uh, the topic of my grant, which was um, the investigation of intermetallic magnets, spans chemistry and physics. So in a way I did not have to look for interdisciplinarity because it was already embedded in the proposal. We also had very active uh, interactions proposed with national labs. Uh, so in that sense um, it was just an interdisciplinary grant. Uh, I did not have a very detailed educational evaluation uh, program there, uh, even though it's uh, requested by the NSF in a way. Uh, my uh, goals were just to set up the materials curriculum, right? So my evaluation was, let's see after two, three years, if we have this curriculum in place, how it works out, you know, how many students are involved in the courses. Uh, for uh, uh, materials characterization techniques, you know, how many requests we get for the materials that we produce and that sort of uh, measurements. But it will be different for each uh, kind of educational activity you have. And I would say that the best way to approach it is to think uh, how will you gauge if what you're doing gives some useful results, right? And in each kind of educational proposal, it will be slightly different. In terms of research, it's easier because you can measure your success by the number of publications, number of citations, and usually uh, it's implied by the uh, funding agency that those are the markers you have to produce. Unexpected results are good, so you shouldn't be worried about those, but um, uh, when I write any proposal, I have in some very risky parts of the proposal, I would have a statement, like a brief paragraph, uh, considering alternative pathways. For example, if you're trying to uh, synthesize this compound, but we don't achieve that, what could be alternative ways? And so usually we set uh, two, three parallel possibilities for the high risk parts of the proposal. And that's something you absolutely have to do, uh, not only in a career, but in any proposal with you. Go for something very, very risky, um, especially with NSF. Uh, my experience is it's really difficult to fund the high risk, high payoff research by the NSF. And so you have to have both the uh, high risk part there to, you know, to have an exciting proposal, but you also should have the plan how to proceed in general and what will be the minimum that you can achieve in the frame of your research idea. So, no, my proposal didn't have uh, diversity of components as far as I remember. It wasn't specifically geared to diversity. Uh, my research is in the area of solid state chemistry and uh, condensed matter. So I had to apply to NPS directorate. There was not much uh, option. I didn't contact the program officer, and actually I think well, when we speak about NSF, it has very little value. So I would really recommend to contact much more uh, colleagues who received NSF grants before, uh, talking to them, getting good advice, uh, really thinking about your science. Uh, when it comes to the NSF grant, the program officer doesn't have a lot of say in who gets funding because uh, I mean that's slightly different system than for example uh, DOD and I would 
from my experience, contacting program officer at NSF doesn't really increase your chances to get funded. Uh, it might help you to clarify some questions you have about the budget, about uh, maybe the ratio between the research and education on your proposal. Uh, so I would say if you have any questions, certainly contact the program officer. But if you're just doing that to establish some kind of relationships, uh, I don't think it's going to help you much in terms of finding get your proposal funded. So I did contact a lot of colleagues who were successful career grant writers from other schools and talk to them about uh, what was important, you know, what was uh, uh, helpful, uh, what things to focus on, and that was the most helpful advice I got. Uh, I started talking to them maybe half a year before uh, the proposal was due, uh, you know, look, uh, meeting them at the conferences, talking during those times uh, uh, to some friends, you know, I made calls by phone, but essentially you had to start uh, interacting, asking questions about this, I think, within the year before your proposal, because as you accumulate your ideas and some suggestions, uh, your proposal shapes better and better in your head as well. So these advices that you get, they not only affect uh, your approach to the proposal, but they also affect the content of the proposal in a way. I applied in 2009, in July, and I received uh, uh, the award notification in December of that year, and the grant started in May of 2010. Um, just the library for journals, you know, articles. Uh, I didn't really use much of uh, grant writing resources, but I mentioned that I already had a grant written, you know, ahead of time. And I would strongly recommend submitting a regular and self grant in fall. Uh, if, if you get that grant, that's great. Uh, if you don't get it, then it's a foundation for your uh, career proposal. And the timeline at the NSF is perfect. Uh, for converting the regular grant that you submit in fall into a career proposal that you will submit in summer. Because uh, that's one of the awards that uh, is available from NSF. There are not that many that you can, you know, that you can get in your particular field of studies. Um, it's just a common knowledge that the faculty members at FSU and other Research intense institutions are expected to apply for these grants. Uh, I think it was uh, very helpful in terms of the length. A lot of grants that you get are three years long. I think that's uh, a bit too short, especially if you're a beginning investigator. Uh, so having this career funding for five years was really helpful because we had sufficient time to uh, Kick, kick off the project and expand it and build it and then by the end of five years it was a very strong research program and I would attribute a lot of that success to, uh, to the ability to use that money for five years. Uh, my grant was quite modest so uh, the Majority of that went to student support. Uh, I used uh, you know uh, one summer salary, one month of summer salary from this grant, and uh, a lot went to travel to the Oak Ridge National Lab uh, because we collaborate a lot with people there. Uh, so those were main expenditures, and of course some went for materials and supplies. I restored the career quite early on, it was my third year as assistant professor, so I uh, didn't participate in any proposal reviews before that, but I did after that. Uh, you can ask, uh, you can volunteer, you know, contact the program officers at NSF and uh, ask to, to be invited, and usually they look for reviewers, you know, for panelists. 
uh, I actually was invited to participate after I received my career award. Uh, so uh, that's, I essentially didn't ask, I was just invited after, the, after receiving the NSF award. Once, I mean, I got it in the first try. But I already mentioned, you know, that my regular grant that was written was helpful in making the first application successful. Uh, so that's something that uh, uh, you have to do carefully every time and usually I get initially quite frustrated when I get a negative decision uh, so I take a day to vent and then I sit down and I really think uh, about the criticism even if you don't like the criticism if you don't agree with it the reviewers represent your community and you should try to address that uh, so in you have to find a way to either persuade them that your ideas are valid or fix the problems that they might have seen because uh, if you resubmit your proposal it is likely that you might get the same criticisms again you will definitely get a new criticism uh, but you should try to address every point every critical point raised by the reviewers because they give you the feedback and that's the feedback that will make your proposal better Uh, I did not show it to anyone, I submitted it on, on my own. Uh, I did show uh, my educational, I mean, I mean the entire proposal I didn't show to, every, to anyone, but I showed my educational part uh, to one of my colleagues from a different school who already received the career proposal before that. And so they gave me the feedback on that educational part of the proposal. I mean that, that's the best part, right, so if you can get that proposal reviewed in a regular review process. It is essentially modeling what you expect to see from the NSF career grant. The career grant is very different though because the career proposal should include a large educational portion, but it's still better to get some criticism on your research ideas. Uh, so you can have really good educational part in your career proposal, but it will not get you funded if your research part is weak. Uh, they definitely should apply, they must apply for the career awards. Uh, they should submit in their second year, second summer. Uh, there are three attempts that you're allowed, and if you apply in the fifth year, it's a little bit too late uh, because you're approaching your tenure decision. So the best time to apply is the second, third, and fourth year. I strongly advise against applying in the first year, uh, just because you will have three attempts. and. Applying later will make your proposal stronger because you already got some preliminary results, some ideas that you tried in the lab, in the classroom, outside the classroom. So you tried your research, your education ideas. Uh, you have something to show. So if you apply in the first year, you still might get some preliminary results. But why hurt yourself if you can actually get better and you have much stronger case in, in years two, three and four. So essentially you should apply in your second, third and fourth summer at the FSU after you start. Just try to be creative, thoughtful about your proposals, uh, focus on science, uh, think how you can uh, improve some kind of education. Uh, the educational part is usually quite challenging for many people and one thing that, uh, one great advice I uh, obtained before writing and I used that advice was to try to find out what my department wants in terms of education. Try to think how I can uh, help, how I can join that effort, create something new, how I can help my department to promote the educational efforts. Uh, because usually your help is needed either within the department or within the college. And you can find out those areas and try to participate in them. I think that's probably the easiest way to go about the educational goal. Thank you very much. You're welcome.